How to save the deposit for your first house. In this video, I'm gonna explain exactly how you can do that, put some actionable steps in place to show how you can save the money to buy your first house. Now, at the very end of the video, I'm gonna explain as well how you can leverage other people's money, so use none of your own money, to buy your very first home today rather than saving for it in a few years' time. My name is Jack, I run a property business, buying and selling houses. I also train investors and aspiring entrepreneurs how to make money in property, even when they don't own those properties themselves. So I have a lot of experience in property, I understand how property works. And one of the biggest questions I get asked from people wanting to buy their first home, but also people wanting to buy their first investment property is, how much of a deposit do I need and how do I actually save that money. So the first question, how much do I need? I actually did a video on this previously, so you can go back and check out that video just before this one. But how do you actually save the money for your first property? Now, if you're looking for a residential property, typically you're looking about 10% of a deposit of the purchase price. And as a buy to let, you're typically looking at about 25 Around where I live, you can pick up a two bedroom terraced house for £180,000. You know, in other areas of the country, that can be a lot less. But really, if, you, if you're looking at 10% there, you're looking at about an £18,000 deposit. When it comes to a buy to let, if you're looking at a 25% deposit, it's not unusual to expect to be able to buy a buy to let for about £100,000. So again, even £80,000 in some areas, you, you can get properties very, very cheap as long as you're not stuck to buying in one particular area. If you're happy to be flexible and buy properties across the country. There are plenty of areas where you can buy a buy to let for about 80 thousand pounds. So that means that roughly we're looking about 18 to 20 thousand pounds as a deposit. So how do you actually save that much money? Now the average salary in the UK is about 30 thousand pounds. Working off of that there is absolutely no reason why anybody with that kind of a salary shouldn't be able to buy a property within two to three years. Now I'm not saying it's going to be easy and I'm not saying it's going to be fast, but what I am saying is that you can get there as long as you put these principles into place. Now, before I actually get into talking about how to save the money for a deposit, it kind of goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, one of the best ways to maximize how much you can save is by increasing how much you earn. If the average salary is 30,000 pounds, ask yourself, how can you create and how can you generate more of an income, you know, whether that be upskilling yourself and earning yourself a promotion or, or simply just asking for a promotion or asking for a pay rise. If you don't ask, you don't get. Even if it comes down to setting up a side hustle where you're gonna be earning extra income outside of your normal nine to five working hours or, or whatever it is that you work, there's a number of ways that you can increase your earning capacity. And it's really important, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail on how you can do that or how you would best be suited to do that because I don't know your personal situation, but I'm helping individuals generate a side income alongside their job. I teach people how to do property deal packaging and I've got students making thousands of pounds every month off the back of deal packaging and learning how to deal package. So if that's something of interest, click the link in the description, you can find out more about that. But I'm not gonna go into detail on how you can actually start earning more money. I wanna dive deep into how to actually start saving the money that you're earning to siphon it off and make sure that you have a deposit in the next two to three years. Step number one, you need to actually assess where you are currently. So you need to write out a full spreadsheet of your income and your expenses. So write a big long list, your, your income at the top, and then underneath it, all of your expenses broken down on a, on a monthly basis, what are your monthly direct debits, how much on average do you spend on, on different things, and just write down absolutely everything you can possibly think of that you spend in an average month. Step number two is split this into essential and non-essential expenses. Now, this is where it's gonna get a little bit brutal. So you're gonna separate them into two columns. One that is you absolutely need this to survive. So your rent or your mortgage payments, you need to pay your council tax, you need to pay for your food, things like that. But if you have expenses like a gym membership or a really expensive car payment that you really don't need, you could actually sell the car and get a cheap car, whatever it is. If it's not essential, 
then you need to be willing to ax it. There was actually an article written about millennials saying the reason that a lot of them cannot afford to buy a house is because they're spending too much money on avocado and toast and Starbucks. Now, I don't know how much of that is true, but what you need to look at is what is essential and what's non-essential. And be very, very honest about what is non-essential. Even if you don't act all of it, just start by getting rid of all of it. Just keep your essential costs and we'll work with that for now. Now with your essential expenses that you've got listed on your spreadsheet, what you need to do is now break them down into another two different sets of categories. And one is your flexible and one is your non-flexible payments. An example of a non-flexible payment would be your rent. If you pay your rent on a direct debit every single month, it's gonna be going out on a direct debit that's gonna be fixed, it's gonna remain the same. Things like your council tax, things like that, they are fixed expenses. They're gonna stay the same and you can set it up on a standing order or a direct debit and it'll be the same every month. Then your non-fixed, your flexible, uh, expenses that will be things like your food shop how much uh, petrol that you need to fill your car they are, they're, they're costs that you're going to incur every month but you don't know exactly how much you're going to be spending each and every month on those it's not a fixed price it's not something you can set up a direct debit for it's going to be more of a flexible cost now step number four is to move all of those fixed costs that you have all those direct debits move them into a bank account that you just set and forget Okay, so you've got a bank account there that is sending out all your direct debits, it's all set up, it's all ready to go, but you just set it up and you just leave it to run. Make sure that there's enough money in that bank account every single month to send out the direct debits and fixed costs that you have. Step five is to move your flexible budget. So all the costs that you're gonna incur that are gonna be flexible. So for example, your food, your petrol, the things I mentioned before, those flexible costs, move them into a really good budget-based banking system. So for example, I use Monzo. Monzo is a fantastic bank account. You could, there's, there's other ones out there, but I use Monzo. It's an incredible app. It's an incredible banking system that allows you to set budgets. You can save money you can create different pots and budget really really well even when you have the fixed costs coming out of them they're really helpful to use but especially when it comes to reviewing your expenses and how much you spend every month it's really helpful to be able to see how much you've spent on flexible costs so how much did you pay on your food bill this month how much did you pay for your petrol on clothes and eating out and things like that how much did you spend and you can review that at the end of the month monzo enables you to do that i use it if you are interested in getting signed up to monzo click the link in the description and you can get five pounds when you signed up and i'll get five pounds and you'll be five pounds closer to buying your first house now what you want to be doing is just keeping to your essential costs you will be absolutely blown away if you are dead honest with yourself and you remove all non-essential spending how much money you would have left at the end of the month and if you don't have enough money left at the end of the month then it comes back to that initial comment that i made which is you need to start increasing your earning capacity now just quickly some extra points that i want to make off the back of the steps that i've just mentioned the first one is if you have a high interest loan if you've got a high interest credit card something like that then make sure that you get that paid off first before you start saving it makes no sense to start putting money away into a savings account whilst you're paying 10 15 percent interest on a credit card now i have a credit card that i'm paying off monthly but it's a zero percent interest credit card so it doesn't make sense for me to pay it off early because it's not costing me anything every month by delaying the repayments okay as long as i pay it in installments every single month that will get paid off and that's fine. Whereas if you have loans, if you have debt that is costing you every month, make sure that you get that paid off first thing. The next tip that I wanna mention is allocate every last penny. There's a guy called Dave Ramsey in the US. Now, I don't necessarily agree with everything he has to say, particularly when it comes to investing, but when it comes to saving, his tips are really, really helpful. One of the things he says is to have that budget and to allocate every last penny penny okay so you start by investing into your savings okay then you start by allocating money to your food budget every single month and you keep within a budget and you keep it as strict and as tight as possible but you allocate every last penny following on from that point the other thing I wanted to say is make sure you pay yourself first 
Now, I'm not talking about paying yourself to go out to a Starbucks or to buy some avocado on toast. The first transfer that should be made every single month, every time you get paid, should be into your savings account, okay? And this is where allocating every last penny really comes into play. Because if you know how much you're gonna be spending and you keep to a tight budget, everything else you can allocate into your savings pot, but you need to pay yourself into that savings pot first. Don't just spend your money and see how your month goes, and at the end of the month, if you've got something left over, then put it into a savings pot. Work it out at the beginning, get a strict budget in place, so that when you get paid, you know, right, I can siphon off 500 pounds, 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds, whatever it is, into my savings account, and that gets paid first, and that is a non-negotiable. Everything else, your food budget, your fuel budget, your going out and eating at restaurants budget, which should be axed because it's non-essential, should be done within the leftover budget. Now those are really simple, very straightforward, actionable tips that I would recommend that you do when it comes to saving money. I do this now, I have that exact same process. I have a budget that I review every month, and that's another point actually. When you first get started with this, you need to review your budget, you need to review your spending weekly, and then after a couple of months when you feel like you've got into the swing of it, review your budget every single month. Just before you get paid, just look back on the last month and see where your money has gone, track it, make sure if there's been any overspending, then you dial that back in for the next month. Keep reviewing, keep assessing, and never stop checking your budget. But as I said, those are really actionable steps that you can put into place right now with the money that you have, the income that you have. As I say, if you can increase your income, if you can increase your earning capacity, then make sure that you do it. But whatever you have, whatever you are able to bring in, make sure you put these steps into place because you'll be surprised when you're really strict, when you're really honest with yourself, you will have enough money left over at the end of the month to start putting away towards your first deposit. Now, whilst this video is all about how to save your first deposit for first property that you wanna buy, there are some creative strategies as well where you can actually buy a property earlier on if you're willing to get a bit creative on the investment front. Now, let me break down a couple of those examples for you. The first one, really simply, is to do what is known in the property industry as a joint venture. Now, it doesn't have to be really official and, and really specific, but say, for example, me and my brother, we wanted to buy a house and we wanted to do it as soon as possible, rather than me saving up separately to buy a house and for him to save up separately to buy another house, why don't we combine our income, combine the money that we're making and start buying a house. We can also leverage our affordability to be able to buy a more expensive house. It means we can get onto the property ladder quicker, start paying down a mortgage quicker and start owning an asset that's going up in value even quicker. So a joint venture, essentially partner up with somebody that you know and buy a house, somebody that you trust, obviously. If you want to buy a house and you want to do it quickly, that is a fantastic way to do it because you'll ax the time that it will take to save up for a house it will, it will cut that in half. The other creative strategy, now this is where you're getting very, very creative, but it means that if you are able to put this into place today, you can actually buy a property right now. And this is how it would work. In the property industry, it's known as a buy, refurb, refinance strategy. It's where you buy a property, renovate it to add value, to push the value up, to refinance it and pull out equity from the property. Now, what I would do is the double B, triple R strategy. So it's borrow, buy, refurb, refinance and repay. Now this is how it would work. If you know somebody, whether it be parents, family, friends, wh whoever it is, if you know people that have the capital available to potentially allow you to borrow that money, you could borrow the amount of money that you need for a deposit, so let's say it's 20,000 pounds. You borrow that money, you buy a property, you renovate that property to add value to that property, and then in six months time to a year's time, you refinance it so you get another mortgage on that property, and that means that you can pull equity out of that property, and then you repay your family, your friends, whoever it was that, that lent you that money, plus a bit of interest. So as long as you are adding about 10 to 12% worth of value to the property that you're buying, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to do a borrow, buy, refurb, refinance, and repay strategy to buy your own home. 
Now, if that is a strategy or a topic that you'd like me to go into a bit more detail about in another video, make sure you drop a comment below because I'd love to know if that is of interest to people. But I hope you found this video helpful. I hope the tips that I've given you are things that you can take away, start to action and start saving towards a deposit on house. Even if you're not looking to buy a house, they're really good habits to get into to be able to manage and maintain your money and your finances really well. I hope the video's been helpful. Subscribe if it has been. Make sure you don't miss out on future videos by clicking on the bell notification. You'll get notified whenever videos come up. As I say, if you are looking to increase your income capacity, I teach people how to make money through property even when they have no money through a strategy called deal packaging. If that's of interest, find out more through the link in the description. If you want to sign up to Monzo and get five quid, sign up to it through the link in the description. And if you want to watch another video, YouTube seems to think that you would like this one. So why don't you check it out and I'll see you in the next video.